encounters improve the quality of our lives. Encounters come to reveal to us the futility of life without God. Encounters will activate purpose and calling in our life. Encounters come to restore intimacy and fellowship. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. Encounters come to restore intimacy. Encounters come to reveal to us the futility of life. If you don't have a relationship with God, anything of value can become God to you. Welcome to Encounter Jesus Ministries, sustaining an experiential knowledge of God and walking in the fullness of our eternal ordination. Now, listen to God's servant, Apostle Oropo Michael, as he takes us through an encounter with the world. Worship, 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 worship,
to say
fellowship. Thank you for the honor of interacting with your presence. Thank you for the light of your word that comes to build us up, to give us inheritances amongst them that are sanctified. 
we bless you, we honor you, even for tonight, for the things we'll be receiving. We ask that you alone take the praise and let your name be glorified. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. <laughs> oh, glory to Jesus. You, you tap, big tap. Big tap. Don't live there. I want to again honor God's servant, Prophet Dokosi, for the privilege of standing here to share with us the word of God. Thank you so much, sir. It's an honor. Always. Always, always an honor, never to be taken for granted. Tonight, I just want to build up a little on some of the things we started looking at yesterday. I want to believe some of you went home and meditated on the truth that you heard. Because the beauty of the word is not just in the hearing, but it's in the doing. He said, when we behold the mirror... We should not step away like forgetful hearers, but doers. He said, then we shall be blessed. Hallelujah. And tonight, I want to share with us, again, trusting that we will not just meditate on it this time, but we will put it to work. Because what God is doing is to raise a generation. Before now, God sent individuals to different generations and they served as the light bearers but you see we are in the last days so god is not just sending men he's raising an army and so everybody must become the truth that we hear that's when we will build enough resistance against the devil so god is not looking for one special apostle one special prophet is raising a people a people that can showcase his glory, demonstrate his power, and bring his truth to a dying world. And I believe you are part of that generation. <laughs> Praise God. It's tagged Activate, and it's an overcomers conference. And so everybody leaving this conference is expected to go into his sphere of influence and dominate. And I know you will leave this place tonight charged and ready to take over your word in Jesus name Amen. I'll do a quick recap maybe for 15 minutes or 20 minutes um, and then we'll build more you know there's so much to say that we have to compress but I believe that God will get us to hear much more than I will say that as I'm talking the Holy Ghost will be opening up different syllables in your heart so that you receive much more than I'm saying. And so last night I said for us to become overcomers and for us to be awakened to the various dimensions and graces that God makes available to the believer, there are three major things that we must grow in, three major realities. And I said because of the importance and the significance of these realities, God decided to give them to us for free because there's no way we would have ended it even if we tried in a thousand lifetimes. Praise God. And I said there are three major realities that God makes available to us that every believer who must win and dominate his world will have to receive and grow in from one level to another. The first, I said, is eternal life. And because you cannot buy it, God gifted it to everyone that believes. In fact, I told us that in the Garden of Eden, the zenith of that divine enterprise would have been that moment where man ate of the tree of life. That is when the creation of man would have been completed. Because the creation of man was a process. God created a spirit, but because his spirit did not have a legal envelope, to function in the physical world he was within God and so God went back to create what he will live in and so man was created in Genesis 1 26 when God said let us make man in our own image and he said in the image of God he made man male and female he made them both 
So he, were, he was created. But there was no way the man could live on earth. Because there's, the raw material with which the man was created is God himself. And so if God put the man on earth, the man would have been spirit. And it would have been impossible for the man to function because this is the visible realm. And so God created the man and left the man inside him. And came to the dust. And in Genesis 2, 7, he gathered the dust together. And the Bible said he formed the man from the dust. That's the body of the man. And when God was done, he said he breathed the man that was on his inside as breath. And the man became a living soul. So it's a complex divine technology. That's the first time that level of machinery was put into creation. Because nobody knew how God created beings. Everybody just came to discover themselves. No spirit knew how they were created. The first time God decided to allow creation to peep into the articles of creation was when he embarked on the creation of man. And because of the order of man's creation, man needed to operate on three lives. The first life would power the flesh. And so Leviticus 17, 11, it said the life of the flesh is in the blood. That's why you have blood in you. And that is why if a doctor wants to trace anything in you, he just gets a sample of your blood. Everything about your DNA is trapped in your blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. But you are not just flesh, you are also soul. If you study 1 Thessalonians 2.23, it says that God, the God of peace will make you whole, spirit, soul, and body. So there is also a soul component of you. But you see, what powers your soul is the breath of God. That's why when God breathed into the man in Genesis 2.7, the man became a living soul. And so at the time the devil intercepted the creation enterprise, man was still not yet complete. He had the life of the body, he had the life of the soul, but the life that should have awakened his spirit to the realm of God, he didn't have it. And I told you yesterday that until the time the man was intercepted, he could not ascend to God's realm. God was the one who kept coming into the garden in the cool of the day because he needed the spirit life to be able to participate in the economy of the heavens. And he didn't have that light yet, life yet, so there was no legality of participation. Even though he was an enthroned entity, he couldn't ascend to God's realm. So God kept coming to him. But the idea in the mind of God was that this man will eat of the tree of life. Because there was a third kind of life in the garden. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 9, it said God planted many trees in the garden and the tree of life was also there. If man had eaten of that tree, he would have become an immortal. He would have been exactly like God. But the devil came and intercepted the program and the man could not eat it. So the moment the man became guilty of sin, God himself said, let us drive him out of the garden. Because if he puts his hand into the tree of life and eat it, he will become like one of us. The challenge this time would have been that he would have been like God, but he would have been corrupt. And if he is corrupt in that state, he would have been condemned forever. It would have been impossible to redeem him. This is why when the devil fell, there was no program of redemption. If angels fall, there's no program of redemption because they are corrupt in immortal state. And so in order for man to be redeemable, God decided to take him out of the garden because the next thing he would have done was to eat of the tree of life. And he would have received a life that is incompatible with corruption. And so the man operated like an animal and eventually he died. And so when God decided to bring the man to an upgraded class of existence, the first thing God gifted the man was eternal life. Eternal life is a God kind of life. That is the life that authorizes the man to function like God on earth. I told us yesterday when I was attempting to define eternal life, I told us eternal life is not just a life that does not end. When you study the Bible, there are many verses where you find that word used as everlasting life, indicative of the fact that the life does not end. That is part of it, but it's deeper than that. And there are also people who try to explain eternal life as a quality of life. Yes, it's a quality of life because there are attributes that are consistent with this life. But you see, it's not just a quality of life. Because if you call it a quality of life, you can just say it's a unique life. That sustains certain attributes. But the truth is that from where that word was translated in the Jewish Bible, it is not called eternal life. Neither is it called everlasting life. It is actually called life unto the age. 
It means it's a kind of life that is consistent with a civilization, an age that is to come. So eternal life is actually the life that exists in the world to come. The reason you call it a quality of life and you are still correct is because that life has certain attributes. And so if you bring those qualities, it will mean you understand it. But it's a bit deeper than that because it is beyond those qualities you are talking about. It actually gives you the right to participate in that age. And if you call it everlasting life, you are still correct because since it's the life of the age to come, it means it won't end until that age come. That's why it's everlasting. But over and above these definitions, it is a life that is consistent to an age. And so when God gave us eternal life, he made us to become participators of the world to come. It is now our choice, therefore, to live the reality of the world to come now. So a believer who is living based on the things men go through is his choice. He has the potential of living beyond this world. He has the potential in this world to live the life. And so I said, eternal life is access into the resources of the age to come. And so a man who has eternal life can in this life live like a creature that has raptured. He has the power to live like a being of the world to come while he's yet in this world. And I told you that the only man who walked in eternal life at the time when it was brought back to the earth was Christ. If you read the Bible, the man who maximized the potential of eternal life is Christ. That's why Jesus alone can be your example. And when you study the life of Jesus, he did things that were not normal. Before Jesus came, when men are sick, you look for herbs. You look for doctors to help you quickly. And if the doctor say it's over, it's truly over. But you see, when Jesus came, he came with the technology of another age. And so when they told him a man is leprous, those days when you have leprosy, they tie a bear around your neck because medical science had not advanced to a level of discovering the cure for leprosy. So when you have leprosy, yourself will be singing, I am unclean, I am unclean, so that people will go away. Suddenly they found a man walking and when he saw lepers, he will touch them. The first question is, are you okay? Because if you touch a leprous person, you will contact it. But in this case, instead of contacting it, he cured it by touching the leprous person. The reason is because the life of the age where he is coming from, they don't fall sick there. That's eternal life. So when he touches the sick person, he imparts the quality of that age into that person. So what you call healing is actually a transmission of eternal life. Because the age where that life came from, sickness does not exist. They saw Jesus, he went to the mountain to pray. And at the ninth hour, it was late. There was no boat. Now, if there is boat, you can use it. Like I told you yesterday, why? Because we also have the animal life. So we will relate with men. But in case what men are doing no longer works, we can't be stranded. So when there was no boat anymore, the disciples suddenly, who went nine hours earlier, saw somebody walking on the water. And they say, it's a ghost. And they started screaming. And he said, no, it's me. I'm not a ghost. The life I operate in, we walk on water too. <laughs> I'm sharing this because I'm trying to make a point that we are not growing in Christianity. In our day to day, even if we are doing church growth conference, it's about number. All the strategy, I've been online studying church growth. Everything you find about church growth is numerical growth. So there are a million people and they are babes. That's why even when we gather in VG, we are singing and shouting. The principalities are not moved. Imagine if one million infants gather together and start saying the president of Ghana must be removed. You see one million infants will pass and say we won't, we no go agree, we no go agree. 
you will say quickly help them. They, they will they will help. Them. That's what is happening. You people they say number number and we gather in in vigil. We will change the nation. We, and the angels are these are people with pampas. They are calling things they don't know. Help them because church growth is about number, not about stature. We have not taught people how to maximize eternal life. One of, the, one of the essence of Christianity is to master eternal life. The way you mastered your natural life. You know when you were born, you didn't know how to walk. You were crawling. You began to master this life. And so from a child, you learned how to sit down. As the muscles and the bones of the back became stronger. You now started crawling. After a while, you started walking. You started running. A point came, you started brushing your teeth. Now you dress where well, you cut your hair. And you appear like a prince. Is because you have mastered the natural life. You have conditioned the natural life until excellence is coming out of you. Christianity is actually an attempt for you to also master eternal life. So when they look at you, you will be a physical expression of Christ to your generation. That's what Christianity is about. But it began with a gift. God gifted us eternal life. The second gift God gave us is the gift of righteousness. And that's what I'll be talking about tonight. The third gift he gave us is the gift of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it's the Holy Ghost that came first. He's the one that imputed righteousness and eternal life into us. But in this conference, we can't talk about the gift of the Holy Ghost. I will only attempt to speak about the gift of righteousness tonight. He said in Romans 5.17, that they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. So righteousness is about reigning. And I will talk about reigning. But you see, like I was saying, the church must come to that point where we begin to learn eternal life and to master it. Because number one, you need to know that you have it. Because there are many who are not even aware that they have it. So the first place of contact is to know how to receive it. All of our evangelical campaign is an attempt to dish out eternal life. And the way you receive eternal life is just to believe in Jesus that he's the son of God. He came to die for your sins and he didn't just die because he was killed. He died because he laid down his life. Because when you have eternal life, you actually can't die. That's why I said this power, this commandment I have received of my father. I have the power to lay down my life and to take it up. So he actually didn't die. He laid down his life. And when three days was over, like he said, he took it up again. So when we preach Christ, we are dishing out eternal life to people. He said in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So when you believe in Jesus, what God does is that he credits eternal life into your spirit. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, the Bible said, this is the record. In case you think this is about a feeling. You don't need to feel it. Are you feeling your life? No, you are not feeling it. You don't have to feel your life to live it. There is a place of feeling, but your life is bigger than feeling. Even when you are not feeling, you are alive. Are we together? But when you are healthy, you should have some feelings. But it doesn't mean the life is dependent on feeling. So in 1 John 5, from verse 11 to 13, it says, in case you don't know this truth, this is God's record. This is how God sees it. He said, this is the record. God had given us eternal life. And he said, this life is in his son. And he went further in verse 12. He said, he that had the son had life. And he that had not the son had not life. This is the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. It's not I go to church. It's whether you have believed in Jesus and received him or not. Because if you don't believe in Jesus, you don't have life. And he said, these things... I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So if you believe in the name of the Son of God, he says, I want you to know that right now you have eternal life. What then is the problem? The problem is that many have eternal life, but they are not aware. And so the purpose of the Activate Conference is to bring you that awareness. And one of the ways that awareness is brought to you is to preach to you the attributes of eternal life so that faith will rise on your inside. It's as faith rises on your inside that you start putting that life to work. You will now experientially know 
that you have eternal life. Because it will take this eternal life for you to actually be an overcomer. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, he said, Whoever is born of God, whatever is born of God, overcometh the world. He said, This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And so yesterday we said, Anyone who has eternal life, there are five attributes that his life must command. And so if you have not started seeing it, it's because you are either not aware that you should operate like that, or you are aware but you have not started putting it to work. So what this conference will do for you is to go and begin to apply yourself onto the things that you have heard. And you will see the way the Holy Ghost will confirm it. It will humble you. It will so humble you. And so we said the first attribute of eternal life is immortality. 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 And I said immortality is actually a state of unending excellence. It's a state where nothing fails. It's a state where you literally become without corruption. Because mortality means corruption. Immortality therefore means without corruption. On the strength of this, it is normal for the Christian to always operate in the state of excellence. Flawlessness is our nature because we picked it from God. It is what eternal life puts in your spirit. And that's why when a man truly becomes spiritual, he becomes excellence driven. It is a nature that he cannot deny. It's eternal life that puts it there. But over and above physical excellence, this is a state of failurelessness. And this failurelessness is the reason why a man with eternal life cannot be sick. When your lungs are failing, there is a technology on your inside that can activate it. When your liver is failing, there is a technology on your inside that can activate it. But if you are not aware, you will not know that the power of immortality is on your inside. And this is why we preach the gospel. And this is why men hear the gospel and they are healed. The Bible said Paul was preaching somewhere, Acts 14. And an important man sat down and was listening to him. And Paul perceived that he had faith to be healed. As he was talking, eternal life was being stirred. And it dawned on the man that he shouldn't be impotent. And while he was yet hearing, strength began to enter his leg. The strength was always there, but it was activation happening through the gospel. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10, it said he has brought immortality and life to light through the gospel. That immortality is what eternal life has put in your spirit. A man who has eternal life comes into a renewed consciousness. And when things are going wrong in your body, instead of being afraid, you are awoken to faith. And you tell yourself, my eyes can't fail. My hands can't fail. My kidney can't fail. My liver can't fail. Because when you talk, you energize the life. The life feeds on the word of God. And so every time you notice something is going wrong, what you need to do is to stay eternal life. The life is there, but it needs to be exercised. And so it is your exercise of that life that energizes that life. A Christian is not a failure. If a Christian is a failure, then Jesus made a mistake when he said you are the light of the world. You are supposed to come to correct the error of the world. You are a city set upon a hill that cannot be hid. You are the standard the world is looking for. You are supposed to come to show the world how it is done. If yourself is a failure, then how can you be an example to the world? And so believers need to begin to master eternal life. That when people are hopeless, they run to us. And when they run to us, we don't tell them stories. We give them answers. Because the answer is on our inside. Immortality. A state without corruption. I said the second thing about eternal life is let me follow the order. Because there are three things I said yesterday instead of five. The second thing I said about eternal life, I said is a state of glory. When God gave you eternal life, he put his glory on you and I took time to correct something that many have not known that has kept us in the state of mediocrity it has been noised abroad in the body of Christ that God cannot share his glory how many of you have heard that I have preached it and it's not wrong 
It's just a matter of semantics. When we say God cannot share his glory, we mean God cannot share the praise for what is done through us with us. It must be clear that he's the one in us walking what is happening. Because the reason he sends us out is because we are a sign. He said, this sign shall follow them that believe. A sign does not point to itself. A sign points to another source or another location. And so every time something happens, we must turn people to God that is the worker. He's the doer, not us. So that people don't praise us. They praise the God on our inside who is working. However, scripture reveals that God shares his glory with us. Because the glory of God is the essence of God. And if God does not put his essence on you, there's no way you can shine in your world. The very first man God created, it was his attempt to put glory on him. That's why when man fell, Romans 6.23 said, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans chapter 8, from verse 28 to 30, in 30 particular, it says, Him that he foreknew, he predestinated. Him that he predestinated, he called. And he said, him that he called, he justified. And he said, him that he justified, he glorified. There are many people who teach it and they say, that is what will happen after rapture. He's not talking after rapture. He's using past terms. He said, he has glorified you. He didn't say he will glorify you. He has already put his glory upon you. And in John 17 verse 22, Jesus said something. He made it most clear. He said, the glory that you have given to me, he said, I have given it to them. And the reason you are able to host God's glory is because eternal life is on your life. Now, when you begin to communicate God to your world, it is the glory on your life that you are communicating because the glory is the essence of God. How can you touch the sick and they are healed? It's because when you touch them, glory transfers from you to them. That glory is the God element in you that touches them. And that's why you cannot claim you are the one who healed the sick. Because it's not your hand necessarily that is healing the sick. It's the glory that is on your life that is healing the sick. So you need to direct the people back to God so that God takes the praise. But the glory that is on you is what affects your world. In Hebrews chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3, it says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners, Speak in time past unto the fathers by the prophet, has in this last day spoken to us by his son. He said, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. If you don't embody the glory of God, you can't show God to your generation. When he said, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, like the waters cover the sea. It's as the earth interact with us that they see that glory. As we multiply, glory should multiply. And so when we are gathered together in an assembly like this, especially when we are worshipping, the environment should be choked with too much glory. So much glory that people who entered with problem, even if they were not prayed for, the amount of glory in the atmosphere should choke their crisis. That's why we pray corporately. That's why we, we worship corporately. Because we want to collocate glory together. And when the atmosphere is charged with glory, whether the man of God touches you or not, something is touching you. What would have touched you when the man of God touches you is already touching you in the atmosphere because glory has saturated the atmosphere. This is why coming to church is a must because it's a place where we harness glory. And as we harness glory corporately, that glory begins to address the issues of men. But the church must become aware that we are glory carriers. We are carriers of glory. When you go to your office, you brought glory there. When you go to your business, you brought glory there. And this is the point. When the glory of God is on your life, how can you fail? The Bible said when Israel came out of Egypt, the antidote God gave them was his glory. He said the Shekinah was upon them. If they come into a nation, the army of that nation can be as terrible as they want. They can't defeat Israel because the glory was on their life. He spoke of a king called Sihon, king of the Amorite. He spoke of another king called Og, the king of Bashan. He said these men had warriors that were like beasts. If you look at them, they were like lions and leopards. But when Israel showed up, they didn't need to carry the disposition of a beast. They came with the shout of the king. The king was among them. And so if Israel carries stone, they will defeat you. 
If they carry stick, they will defeat you. If they are singing, they will defeat you. Because there is something invisible on their life. This is why he said, whatsoever he doeth, he shall prosper. My business cannot fail. My ministry cannot fail. Nothing we do fail because there is glory on our lives. If you don't know this, you will be praying and fasting for what is already done. When you pray, pray for deeper things. Ask God to show you mysteries. Ask God to bring you to deeper intimacy. Ask God to show you greater dimension. It's, see, his children that pray, Father, let this business prosper. How can the business fail? It's already a law in the spirit. Whatsoever he doeth, he shall prosper. He didn't say whatsoever he prays for. Unless I'm not doing it, if I'm involved, it must prosper. It's glory. There's glory on our lives. When I touch you, glory touches you. If I enter that business, glory is invested. I know it. And so every time you grow in God, you grow in glory. When you pray, the glory is increased. When you worship, the glory is increased. Did you not read about Jesus? He said as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. His raiment began to glister. He knew that prayer was more of a glory economy than it was a religious activity. The Pharisees were praying for people to clap for them. They will start by street corner, distracting themselves in prayer. Just the way we do in church today. Somebody carries mic. He wants everybody to call him a prayer warrior. Hebo, hika, hebo. He's not even praying. Jesus will hide himself. He will go to the mountain. Because there are certain distractions that are not tolerated. Because you are entering a glory economy. The other time in Matthew 17, he said as Jesus was praying, he said a cloud descended from heaven. And in that cloud, some escorts came from heaven. He said they stood with him Moses and Elias. Candidates, agents of glory came through that cloud. Prayer for him was the glory economy. Somebody looks at you and he said, I'm depressed. Me, depressed? How? How? Say somebody lied against him. Somebody accused him. Really? Is that person so important? Who is that important that will lie against me and I'll become depressed? Even if everybody decides to turn against me, when I enter my closet, I meet other unions. I have, I have fellowship beyond men. I, have, I enter dimensions beyond men. He said, you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, to an innumerable company of angels, to the spirit of just men made perfect. All your friends can betray you. That's their business. You have other friends in Zion. You are a creature of glory. Life has brought you into glory. The whole prophets in Ghana can turn against you. Didn't you read about Jesus? He fulfilled destiny on the cross. Because of glory. You can't, see, you can't fail. You are a creature of glory. That's what eternal life came to do for you. The apostolic is failing, sir. With all due respect. You see, we attack prophets every day. Say fake prophets. And it's good. God is raising checkers in the body of Christ to address issues of false prophet and that's a great blessing because it's a very serious ministry number one your character must be flawless to be able to do that number two you must have spiritual ranking approved of God to be able to do that that's why not all of us are attacking them because we don't have that rank so we thank God but there is more to the apostolic office the apostolic office is the office that takes the body of Christ from one dispensation to another the apostolic office is the office that matures the body of Christ. Every time the body of Christ is to shift in revelation and to enter higher levels of inheritance, God sends apostles because it is in that office. That's why apostles come first. The prophets see it, they proclaim it. The apostles carry doctrine and bring the body into it. The prophet can alter it and whoever has intimacy with God can enter. But when the apostles come, through teaching, they shift the whole body to enter and so it is more dangerous to have fake apostles than to have fake prophets we need God also to awaken the apostolic move we have reduced the apostolic move to showmanship when one person enters a dimension instead of having a burden of bringing the body of Christ he enters and sits there and build Babel around himself the whole move becomes a big auditorium and everybody comes to watch him shine and it becomes a demigod among people. That's why there's witchcraft in Africa. We don't know why God brings us into dimensions. 
If the body of Christ still doesn't understand eternal life to the level of perfecting immortality and perfecting this level of glory living, then there's something wrong. You still have thousands of people lining up to be touched. When we should be generating glory in our closet, that when we gather together in church, people should be known by the glory they carry. Paul said, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. That means if you come, we know what you represent. Church departments is still about choir, media. When we should be having new kinds of departments, when you come to church, you say, these ones are workers of miracles. These ones are seers. These ones are prosperity agents. That's how departments should be in church. That everybody represents a dimension. But how can that happen if we have not seen ourselves in the glory? We still know men after the suit they wear. And so church is about malice, jealousy, envy. We are infants. Are you following? Eternal life brought us into an economy of glory. If you leave this conference, tell yourself, I'm not ordinary. When you are praying, be conscious. There's something happening on your inside. There's glory there. You don't need to be an apostle or a prophet to walk in the glory. The Bible said widows receive their dead back to life. Women that should be pitied in society, they tapped into something and they began to raise the dead. What did they touch? We have greater measures, but we have not exploited it. Eternal life awakens the economy of glory. Number three, I say eternal life brings authority. Authority. In John chapter 1 from verse 11, it said he came unto his own, his own received him not. Um, I need to recap this. I want you to catch it. If this is all I do here, it's fine. It's not about many teachings. It's about what you can lambano. Catalambano, catch something and go with it. That's the body. We have a thousand and one teachings on YouTube. People have heard too many teachings. There's nothing, no subject you are looking for now that you don't have at least hundred teachers that have taught it on YouTube. If you type, the list is endless. But we are the carriers of those truths. We are the carriers. This should be our body. Eternal life brings you into authority. He said he came into his, unto his own. His own received him not. He said, but as many that received him, he said to them, he gave the right. Because it takes authority to become a son of God. A son of God is one who executes God's government. That's why in John 3.3, 3, he said, except a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom. It's about government. It's about dominion. But it will take life for you to come into this economy. It will take life for you to participate in this economy. And so what eternal life did for us is that he opened the gate of authority for us. As we now walk in it, God expects us to grow. To grow. I told you yesterday, no matter how intelligent I am, as far as Dana is concerned, my intelligence is inconsequential. Because when they need something, they will begin with citizens. I'm Nigerian. They don't need what I have to offer. They need citizens because the goal is to empower the citizens. So you now who are a citizen, now that you are a citizen, the next thing is to look for which corridor to explore. You can enter politics and grow in that cadre until you become president. You can enter the economy and grow in that cadre until you become one of the strongest economic giant. You can enter the academia and grow in that cadre until you become a professor. Your choice is now what you want to grow in. So what eternal life did is to open us into dominion and authority. Our growth in eternal life now is supposed to be a journey into levels of dominion from one level to another level from one level so as you are mastering eternal life you will discover that different tributaries begins to open to you so you begin to press into it there are certain persons that god will open the corridor of revelations to when they open the bible they see what nobody sees and as they are growing in it so many things are happening around their lives they are those god gives a voice when they sing it's like angels and as they are growing that voice, nations are opening to them. They come to a point where they are singing, demons are expelled. That same song that you can sing at home and enjoy, they are singing that song, doors of nations are opening to them. They are singing that song, people are giving them gifts that you can't work for in a lifetime. Somebody went somewhere and sang and they gave her a good mind. 
you will work for 10 lifetimes you can't earn enough salary to buy one but you have explored a possibility in eternal life and it has attracted things to you that there is no physical competence that would have brought it that is what god does and as you grow this eternal life a point will come it said gentiles will come to your light it said but kings will come to the brightness of your rising this immortal substance that god put in you will break out so much that it is kings that it will attract that's what god designed so that no believer is stranded you don't need a certificate to do this you need intimacy to achieve this and so it becomes a choice for everyone it's not a language you speak in the tongues of men it's a language you understand in the spirit eternal life access to authority number four eternal life is actually a reality that defies death it's a state of deathlessness and there are two things i will say here john chapter 11 let's look at verse is that verse 26 now help me quickly john 11 25 26 let's see this let's see what jesus said here i'm showing this so that you will know that we are backward christianity we are not we have not grown up. we have made the mistake of using church attendance to be growth in the spirit the church is an obese you know this symptom of obesity imagine a child of two years becoming so fat yet not growing upward and not building muscles that's what the church looks like we have we have made the mistake of assuming because thirty thousand people gather that is growth if we grow in stature we will grow in number but if we grow in number we may not grow in stature that's the problem we have not understood see what jesus said these are the areas where we should be growing in he said jesus said unto her i am the resurrection and the life he said he that believeth in me though he were dead he shall live again that means those who met jesus after death there is a hope for them to be raptured are you following so they believed him but they didn't meet him they spoke to them about the coming Messiah. They accepted the message. They opened their hearts to God. All the prophets in the Old Testament are in this category. They heard about it. They believed it. But they never had the opportunity of meeting him to receive it. These ones have died. He said they will live again. And then he went to us who are alive. And he said, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So what God expects is for us to live and be raptured. The question is, why are Christians dying physically? We are dying physically because we learned this truth late. And our soul has not been completely renewed. A generation is coming. If you get your child before he starts talking, and you start declaring these things over your child, and then as your child is growing, you start teaching your child this truth from the beginning, and your child grows with it you will be shocked that that child may never die there is corruption in our soul your your life is in your subconscious it takes a lot for that aspect of you to be renewed that's why ephesians 4 24 said that you should be renewed in the spirit of your mind the reason we still die physical death is because the spirit of our mind is not completely renewed we heard this truth late. We have accepted other things that have formed our consciousness. There are people sitting here, although you have been a Christian for 30 years, but bitterness is still a stain in your subconscious mind. Because when you were growing up, they abused you in primary school, they frustrated you, and so bitterness entered you. There are people here that their parents molested them. So unforgiveness is registered in their subconscious mind. There are people here that were told while they were growing up that there are demonic spirits in the dark. It has planted fear in their soul. And so one way or the other, there is a dent on our subconscious. This is why we have not yet been completely renewed. And that's why death still finds a way. If you get to the point where through meditation on this truth, you are able to completely renew your subconscious mind, death will be deleted. Because what Jesus said is not a lie. He said, do you believe this? 
And Paul came to corroborate it. He said, we shall all not die. He said, some of us shall be changed. There are those who will live and won't die until the rapture happens. He said they will be changed. He didn't say they won't die because they are young. And even in the Old Testament, there are men who have defied death. Enoch didn't die. Elijah didn't die. And so death is not a must. There is a generation coming that will understand eternal life to a level where they will completely subdue death because it's a possibility in Christ. However, for some of us, who have not mastered it to a point where our subconscious mind is renewed. When you are sick, take drugs. <laughs> That's why God decided to create other advantages like herbs, like, like doctors, so that while you are growing, you are supporting yourself and you'll keep growing. And if you die before Jesus comes, you are not hopeless. He said, they that are dead, he said, they will live again. Because if you don't believe that you will not die, what is the assurance that you will live again? Because it's the same scripture that captures both. It says if you die, you will live again. And in the same verse, it says you will not die. So if you are alive and you don't believe that you will not die, why are you sure that your belief that you will live again is a faith? Are you following? So if you die, you are not hopeless. It just means you have not mastered it. But there is another opportunity. When the trumpet sound, you will live again. But if you are alive, fight and press to master it. You know what Paul said? He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering that I may be made conformable. Paul knew that it was possible in this life to become like that. So Paul's desire, he was pressing to know him and that power of resurrection that in this body he will become conformed. In 2 Corinthians 5 from verse 1 to 2, he said, we have a heavenly tabernacle. He said, for this cause we groan that we might be clothed. Paul knew that it was possible to be clothed in this life. He knew it because eternal life is deathlessness. If the church is growing, maybe by now we would have attained this. Some of us would have known it. But even though we got it late, we will say it so that the next generation will catch it early. If we didn't catch it, let our children catch it. That when they go to primary school and they are talking, they will not be talking about Batman. They will not be talking about Simpson. They will not be talking about cartoons. They will be talking about the life of God. That your child at the age of five can look at somebody who has a wound and he will touch it and the wound will be healed. Because he's learning eternal life. He's mastering eternal life. That your child can come home and the tire of your car is punctured and he can seal that tire with his hand. He has learned something. That's what eternal life is. When our children gather, have you seen the children of witches? They know how to fly. They can send a witch of 10 years on apprenticeship to a family. And that witch will kill the whole family in three years and come back. She has graduated. A witch of 10 years can stand on the road and somersault a car. And that witch, that witch is on IT. And the assignment is to go and tumble a car. Meanwhile, the people in that car, the man is a Christian for 30 years. He's even an elder in church. And he's going home with, the, with his family in the village. They say, car some assaulted. And a Christian of 30 years is killed by a witch who is less than 8 months in the witch coven. So the question is, who is older in knowledge? Our children need to master eternal life. That when a demonic radiation is coming, your son will wake up at night and send it back because he has intelligence. Intelligence in light. Intelligent. These are the things that should trouble you. But the church, we carry children and put in children's church and they are singing songs. And in the demonic coven, a girl of 10 years can be the queen. Who children church? Do you, who told you their spirit is young? The words they hear, they are spirit and life. Educate them in life. Let your boy of five years fill people with the Holy Ghost. If somebody is sick, let your son lay hands on that person and see sick people healed because he's already communicating life. He should have intelligence in light. Your son should be telling you how much energy he can transfer from his spirit into his hand. And he will look at you and say, Daddy, the power of God is on my right hand now. Touch it and see. 
and you will touch it and the power will <laughs> you will be slain it's eternal life that's what Jesus brought us to it's a word and we must exercise ourselves in this reality until we master it master it and it becomes our way of life when people come to your house you should know what all your children represent there's one that sees somebody comes with problem you say what is God telling you and your boy of five years or ten years stands up and say what I'm seeing now is this 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 do this do this you will know that age is not time it's a reality in light Number five, eternal life is joy in the Holy Ghost. In Psalm 16, verse 11, he said, Thou will show me the path of life. He said, In thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand, pleasures forevermore. Now, this is the source of strength and stability in the spirit. When a man has eternal life, he should not be tossed, he should not stagger because of the circumstances of life. Because when eternal life enters your spirit, it becomes joy. Joy is different from happiness. Happiness is engendered by things, but joy is of the spirit. You can be full of joy even though you are in the pit. You can be full of joy even though things are not working. Because joy is a spiritual commodity. And that joy becomes your invincibility. That's why Nehemiah 10 said, The joy of the Lord is my strength. The reason a man who has eternal life even if he falls seven times, he rises again. It's because of the economy of joy. There is something on his inside that makes it impossible for him to give up. Every other person can give up, but there's a tenacity. There is a stamina in him that makes it impossible. Even when he wants to change his mind, that life will refuse. And so, everybody will go down, but he will be standing. He said, when men are cast down, you will say, there is a lifting up. What will give you the strength to say that? Is the joy of the Lord. And the way the joy of the Lord is credited into your spirit is eternal life. See, people see men of God and they think all is well. Sometimes when we stand here and we are prophesying to people, our house is on fire. If a man of God tells you what is happening to him when he's laughing in church, you'll be shocked. It's because there is something working on his inside that himself cannot explain. Your own child is dying, whereas you are praying for people and they are being healed. And you still go back home and you are struggling with that circumstance and you will not change your mind. You won't look at God and say, it is not where. You will still be faithful in serving God. It's called the joy of the Lord. I was teaching in the Bible school in 2017. My brother fell into coma on a Monday. I started teaching on that Monday until Friday. He died on Saturday. I came back on Sunday and I was doing impartation. I was laying hands on people, they were falling, receiving the Holy Ghost. While I was praying, I was crying, they didn't know. But I can't deny it. There's, a, a, there's an energy in you that when men should be falling, you are standing. Even you don't know how and why you are standing, it's the joy of the Lord. That's why Philippians 4, 4 said, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. You are not rejoicing because all is well. You are rejoicing because there's a river on your inside. That river is what Jesus said, out of their bellies shall flow rivers of living waters. So that rejoicing for you is a commandment. And he went further in verse 6. He said, be anxious for nothing in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. How can you be giving thanks in all things? When your father died, how do you give thanks? When business is not working, how will you give thanks? Because there is economy of joy in your spirit. Did you not read about Paul? In Acts 16, they were beaten and imprisoned. The Bible said at midnight, they gave thanks and praised, and the prisoners heard them. Suddenly, the foundation of the prison scattered. The reason we recover, regardless of what the devil threw at us, is because there's joy in our spirit. And so what eternal life comes to do is to plant the joy of the Lord in your spirit. That joy is your strength. The reason the devil can't overcome you is because there's joy in your spirit. Joy. 
I preached for a man two weeks ago. They were married for 14 years, no issues. And this man is a specialist of fruitfulness. If you, you are not, if you are not, if you don't have a child, just go there. He has what he calls family intervention night. Sometimes millions of people connect. Greatest testimony, fruitfulness. But for 14 years, no child. Every time he comes, he comes fired up. And as he's declaring, people are receiving. And what the devil was doing in his life was inconsequential. He couldn't stagger him. He couldn't make him to be discouraged. Nothing shook the man. And when his, when his wife eventually took him, they gave birth to twins. And the whole world celebrated. Because the faithfulness of God, you won't see it until you have joy. If you don't have joy, you will give up before God prove himself. But if you have joy, you will tell the devil, throw your best shot. I will be standing here like Mount Zion that cannot be moved. Some of us are not serving God because of what he does. If God chooses not to bless us again, we will still serve him. I told somebody, even if you find me on the hospital bed dying tomorrow, I won't change my confession. Because I have passed the level of manifestation. I have passed the level of celebrating God for what he does. Even if God does nothing, I'm like the Hebrew boys. If he doesn't deliver us from the fire, we will not bow. Oh king, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. Make the fire seven times hotter. We will stand our ground. Denying God will be denying ourselves. There's something here. It's called the joy of the Holy Ghost. The joy of the Lord is my strength. That's what eternal life came to do for you. When you find Christians that fluctuate, they've not activated eternal life. If we tell you what we go through, you will be amazed. But there is joy. Joy unspeakable, full of glory. Joy unspeakable, full of glory. How will they arrest Peter? They want to crucify him. He's not begging for his life. He's not thinking about writing a letter to his wife. Rather, he tells them, please, don't crucify me and face me up. When you crucified my Lord, he was faced up, turned me upside down. I am not, I'm not equal with my master. That's all you can say when you are about to be killed. There's joy. Why do you think none of the disciples denied Jesus? There was joy in their spirit. Even at their last hour, there was a river. They couldn't contain it. That thing overwhelms them. That's why they stood their ground. Too many Christians don't know eternal life. That's why we change our minds. That's why we compromise. Your boss threatens you at the office and suddenly you fidget and you compromise. No, sir, even if I lose the job, I will stand my ground. My life is bigger than the job. The testimony of my existence is bigger than salary. You can't define me based on monthly salary. What I live off is bigger than that salary. I was teaching in a secondary school some years ago. The woman came. And told me to cheat in Wayek. I said, Cheat, are you not aware that they call me pastor? Cheat in Wayek so that you add 5,000 naira to me. You think I'm here because of money? We are bigger than salary, man. Cheat where? She became angry. After a month or two, I had to leave the school. I went, to, I went home for four months. God did nothing. But I told God, You don't have to do anything. Even if for the rest of my life I'm jobless. I have caught something in you that is bigger than money. After four months, I got another job in another secondary school and they made me HOD chemistry. And God was just watching. It was in that school that revival began. And from there, nations, nations, nations. I asked myself, what if I came under the pressure to compromise? You find many young ladies, I'm 26, hey, my husband is not coming. And one crazy young man comes and says, you must sleep with me. And because of pressure, people throw their virginity away because of what society is saying. Even if I don't marry, if it will take compromise, I will walk with audacity at 35. It's not husband that defines my life. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Compromise because of societal pressure? You have not received eternal life. Many are not aware of what we carry. Nothing breaks us. Even on the cross, Jesus was not broken. Nothing breaks us. That's the power to lay down your life and to take it up. Eternal life. Many have it, but they are not awoken to it. And I say, when you are awakened to eternal life, there are four things that define your practice because you have to grow in it. 
You have to grow. I said the first is meditation. What feeds that life is the word of God. If you don't meditate on the word of God, the life in you will not grow. There are many Christians that only hear the word of God on Sunday. They come to church, hear preaching for 35 minutes. How can you be sustained for 168 hours based on food you ate for 35 minutes? Why don't you eat only on Sunday morning and wait till the next week and eat? You eat three times in a day to sustain your physical life and your eternal life. You want to sustain it by eating once in a week. How can you be strong? Eat once in a week and see what your condition will be like in four days. If you are able to walk. That's why there are many Christians who cannot walk in the spirit. They are weak. They are not eating the word of God. And so even though they know they should cast out devils, when demons are there, there's no ability. They know they should lay hands on the sick and the sick should recover. There's no ability because the spirit is not exercised. When you eat the word of God, you are feeding the life of God in your spirit. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's how you strengthen the eternal life. And as you keep eating the word of God, a point will come, you will sense that life begins to flow out of you. When you touch the sick, they are healed. When things are going wrong, you speak, there is a force that comes with your word and it changes circumstances. And people are wondering what happened. The word of God happened to me. Meditation. He said to Paul, to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 13, he said, until I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation and to doctrine. He said, give thyself wholly to these things that your profiting may be made manifest to all. So if you don't give yourself wholly, your profiting cannot be made manifest. Every one of us sitting here has the potential of being a wonder to our world. But how well do you feed that life? Feed that life and see the dimension that will break out of you. Even you will be afraid of yourself. Number two, I said the second way to energize eternal life is by prayer. As Jesus prayed, he said in Matthew 17 verse 2, the fashion of his countenance was altered. The glory in him began to glow. Paul speaking in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 2 and 3, he said, for this cause we groan that we might be clothed with our heavenly tabernacle. There is a glory in you that is trying to find expression, but it is clogged. The world, the distractions of the world, the lust of the world has clogged it. So there is a diamond, but it's hid in debris. When you start praying, you open up everything that clogs the power of that life. And after a while, what will begin to come out of you? Even you can no longer hide it. I remember when God began to break out of me strongly. I went to church and I sat down in a leader's meeting. And the pastor asked a question. And everybody, people were speaking. People were speaking. And I collected, lift my hand and, lifted my hand and collected the microphone. When I spoke, the pastor said, when did this person join this church? How do you know what you said? When meeting finished, a professor walked up to me and said, that thing you said, can you write it for me? <laughs> I said, I don't know it. He came by inspiration. <laughs> I don't know it. I can't write it. He said, what did you say again? I said, what was the question? They asked the question. The second one, I now said, he said, wait, he carried his phone, repeat it. I said, I can't repeat it. <laughs> that one too came by inspiration. You don't know what is buried on your inside. He said you were dangerously and fearfully made. Your maker himself knows that you are dangerously made. The only way they can quantify you is to check your maker. You are a photocopy of a reality and the original is God. But you know the way this photocopy works. Everything in God is in you. But it will take prayer to excavate it. To excavate it. When you are praying, it's not religion. You are digging out things on your inside. There's wisdom there. There's favor. There's power. When you pray for a while, they will start coming out and they will become a river. That river has the potential to water your generation. Those who have gone to Nigeria, they know where Benue State is. You don't have, even if you, if you leave Benue State to Abuja, it's a big achievement. Based on how backward it is. Benue State is 98% civil service. 
The biggest jobs is either lecturing or police. If you get a banking job, you are blessed. That's where it is. If a man leaves Benue to Abuja, it's a big achievement. Very intelligent, but maxed. But when we discovered there was something on our inside, we started searching it, digging into it. I'm telling you, in the last three weeks, I've been to six nations. And it's because I cut it down. While I came here in the last five days, I've received invitation from five nations. Five different nations. From a state where it's a big deal to go to the capital. But something is on your inside. And as you begin to tap into it, kings look for you. Nations look for you. And yourself, you are wondering what is going on. It's a challenge now for me to have 30 minutes to spare in a day. And then you look at yourself. You are checking your age. How come? What is happening? It's eternal life at work. It's the glory of God. It's the excellency of God. And every believer is supposed to carry the same measure. How much of it have you excavated? No wonder the devil fights your prayer. You can watch movies from morning to night, but not prayer. The moment you want to pray, the devil shows up. What are you doing? Don't you know you're about to tap a good mind? Don't you know you're about to bring out treasures? There are treasures locked on your inside. And so when the devil comes to distract you, tell the devil, I know your plan, but I must dig out something. There's a pair that must come out. There's a treasure that must come out. I refuse to be a mediocre. I refuse to be a non-entity. God has planted something and I know prayer is the way of digging it. I will mine everything out. I won't leave this world until I've emptied myself of everything God put there. That's how it works. Prayer is a way of excavating the possibilities of eternal life. Number three. The devil will come and deceive young people. You spend five hours every day in the gym building your chest so that you wear singlet and walk about and show people chest. How much do they give you for big chest? At best, they hire you as a bouncer. You become a bodyguard. You will spend so much time on chest. Dye your beard, shave it, and you are walking. Only you is rubbing hand on your cheek every, every second. There's nothing wrong in looking good, but your life is bigger than a black beard that is well carved. See women going to pump silicone into their buttocks and everywhere to appear. What, 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 what nonsense? Before you are 38, your body begins to fail. You give birth to two children, you are shocked when you look at the mirror. Is this me? He said, though the outward man perishes, he said, but the inward man is renewed day by day. That's where to invest in. Three eyelashes, five mascara, foundation, everything. And the face will change when you are 40. Why don't you build in something that is eternal? There's a glory that will come out of you. That the older you get, the more beautiful you are. Sarah was a grandmother when a queen was admiring her. A grandmother when a queen was admiring her. A woman that is about 60 years plus, a king is admiring her. What powder was she using? There's nothing wrong in looking beauty, beautiful. Shave your beard if you have time. Gym yourself, have a good chest. But your life is bigger than the physical features. How many presidents do you see with a big chest? Does it not suggest to you that it is not about chest? You build chest to go and guide the person who is lanky. They rub cream on their body. The whole skin is shiny like bulb. All their gowns stop here. You say, sit down. And you still got married and you are trying so hard to keep this guy. Because if it is skin, you used to get him. He, there are many other people with that skin. He said, let your beauty be the ornament of, 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 of meekness. There is something about the inward man. There's a glory that that man carries. That as you beam that light, even if your husband is abroad, your thought is with him. You don't need to police him. He can't wait to come back to you. 
because of the ornament of a quiet spirit meekness brokenness the virtues of life flowing out of you like a river that's where the true power is the true power take care of your body it's part of you but spend more time building your spirit if you can go to the gym for three hours every day spend some time in the place of prayer and see what will happen to you something will break out of you that the world will come just to look at it and clap you will become like a spectacle to your generation people will look at you and they'll be satisfied they say you are coming to a place people are taking leave to come there and if you touch them they are overwhelmed you smile at them they can't sleep because of the glory that you carry this is the heritage of the saints we are a wonder to our world but what will make us a wonder is still locked on our inside prayer will excavate it prayer 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 it's a technology of god number three is to be yielded to the promptings of the spirit in romans 8 verse 2 it said the law of the spirit of life that is in christ jesus he said it has set me free from the law of sin and death there's a prompting that that law puts in your spirit when you begin the word set free is the word elutero it's a power it's a power for deliverance and emancipation that power will remain dormant in you until you begin to yield to that law as you yield to that law the force of life in you becomes stronger you will speak the impact will be stronger Anything you do, the outcome will be more glorious and yourself will be asking, what new thing have I learned? It's something breaking out of you. It's a fountain that brings more excellence into your life. And number four is prophetic declaration. That's why you come to church. When words are spoken over you, Jesus said the words we speak, he said they are spirit and they are life. Because Luke 10, Luke 6, Luke 10 16, he said, if they hear you, they hear me. And so if the words he speak are spirit and life, everyone who carries that life when he speaks it is spirit and it is life so when declarations are made it's not a time to be casual it's the time to catch the more you hear the more you beam the more you hear the more you are transfigured eternal life is the god kind of life is the life of the age to come and christians are enjoyed not to live like the people of this world we are to live like the world where we come from and where we are going to that's why he said we are pilgrims on the earth we are ambassadors from another dispensation and what makes us such ambassadors is the life that we carry in the next 10 minutes i touch briefly on righteousness there are two things about righteousness i want to share which is why god gave us that gift in romans 5 17 it said they will receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness he said they shall reign in life. So righteousness comes to make you reign. The word reign in life used in Romans 5.17 is the word king in life. So God wants every one of us to function as a king. In Revelation 1.6, he said unto him that washed us and made us kings and priests. We are not beggars. We are nobles. There is royalty about us. But what imparted that royalty and nobility is the gift of righteousness and there are two things about righteousness the first thing about righteousness is that it is right standing with God so that gift gives you the right to stand in God's presence to be aligned with God and to function at the level of divine approval but for that to have happened the price for your sins was paid for and that's why the economy of righteousness took place when the exchange happened on the cross. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, the Bible said he made him that knew no sin to become sin so that you will become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So it is the cross that imparted righteousness to us. And the reason it was possible is because he took the place of sin and condemnation and he brought you to the place of the approver of God. Now, because righteousness was imparted to you on the strength of the substitution of the cross, there is something the cross insists on. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
from verse 14 to 15, the Bible said that the love of Christ constrains us. It said, we thus judge that if one died for all, they that live should no longer live for themselves. This is why a man who is awakened to righteousness, the first thing he does is that he starts living right. Righteousness is beyond right living. But righteousness insists that you must live right. Because the economy that brought you into righteousness was the economy of the cross. And the cross insists that if it is true that you understand this and believe it, then the love of God must constrain you. This is why a righteous man can no longer live in iniquity. This is why a righteous man, because there is a doctrine going on in the body of Christ today where people say they are righteous, it doesn't matter what they do. It's a lie from the pit of hell. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 and 10, he said, Let no man deceive you, little children. He said, Him that doeth righteousness is righteous. Because you can't claim that you became righteous because Christ died for you, and then you violate the demand of love that you must live right. So a man who is aware of righteousness, before he begins to wield the power of righteousness, he will first of all pay the price to live right. You will submit your body to be crucified. That's why Paul was speaking in Romans 12 from verse 1 to 3. He said, I beseech you dearly beloved that you present your bodies. Anybody who knows is righteous presents his body as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20, he said, your body is not your own. You were bought with a price. The cross where righteousness was credited to you was where the price for you was paid for. And so you can't live for yourself anymore. you find many Christians tell you, I felt like it, so I did it. It's my life. It's no longer your life. Your life is not your own. When Christ died for you and righteousness was credited unto you, you were bought. You now live for God. You don't have the right to do what you want. You do what God says you should do. You have become God's property. Unless you don't understand righteousness. And I can tell you, our generation don't understand righteousness. You find abortion, you find all kinds of immorality, you find compromise on their jobs everywhere. And every day we dress with suit and come to church because we think it's about cosmetic Christianity. When God comes to a generation, he finds out the level of reasonability of that, regen that generation. Living right is a testimony of being reasonable. That now I understand that a price was paid for me. And because that price was paid, I can't live for myself anymore. I can tell you, including pastors, 90% pastors, prophets, and apostles. In fact, it is rare now to find a genuine man of God. And if you can't find a genuine man of God, where will you find genuine Christians from? If fake people are preaching over people every day, how can they be real? And because the men of God know that they are compromised in the very church where they preach, they now tell everybody it doesn't matter what you do. Because the day he dares say it matters what you do, people start crying from the choir. If it matters, how, why did you touch me? So in order for everybody to be at peace, you have to tell them, forget, sin has been dealt with. It doesn't matter anymore. We are all right before God. So that the person you defied will not come out to accuse you. So that the people who saw you live in iniquity will not come out to point you out. And so you find all kinds of management, character management, reputation management in church. Just to make sure every sinner is comfortable. And they keep telling them all is well. Not what you do don't matter anymore. You can't go to hell anymore. You can't be judged anymore. Christ has paid it all. We are the righteousness of God. Righteousness is in nature. It's not what you do. And so whatever you do don't matter. And you find sinners gather themselves and they are psyching themselves. Shouting in church every Sunday and church is all about dancing. That's why you hardly come to church and find people pray for hours. Because if you start praying, what the pastor didn't tell you, the Holy Ghost will tell you. So the prayer has to be shut down. Because if we pray, there's a level you pray to. The Holy Ghost will come and tell you, why did you sleep with that woman's husband? Are you not aware that it's adultery? The Holy Ghost will start convicting you and you will break into tears. And so because the pastor doesn't want to take the risk for people to start colliding with the Holy Ghost, he will withdraw prayer. And church is about dancing. 
And even the dance are the same dance in the clubhouses. Reduce volume from church today and put the dance video. You will not know the difference between church and club. Because we try to massage their appetite in church with the iniquity they are involved in in the world. Because righteousness is no more. Even pastor, you are seeing people dance. Any step, if it comes out of the club in one week, it's already in church. The question is, what are the church members watching? How did you people master this thing so quick? So the frequency they actually connect to is the club. But because they followed their parents to church for a long time, they still come to church. And the pastor is not interested in their growth. He's interested in church being full. And so no matter what they do, so long as they come to church, it's fine. And so naked people come to church, it's okay. Fornicators are in church, it's okay. Club addicts are in church, it's okay. And in case they don't want to come to the church anymore, make the beat look like the club too. So that when they are comfortable in club, they will be comfortable in church. So we are changing the church to look like the club. Instead of discipling the club and taking everybody from there, there's no more power. When you speak about judgment, they say, say Lord, the judgment is over. To keep people in sin. To keep people in iniquity. And that's why the church is powerless. Because when you challenge issues in society, society is a reflection of spirits. Corruption is a spirit. Immorality is a spirit. When you come to challenge things in society, you must make sure that yourself is not under the influence of that spirit. If all of us are in corruption, you can't come to church and start saying, this will happen to the government. This will happen. Nothing will happen. That's why we talk. Nothing happens. Because Ed is one master. We are just in different locations. A fornicator comes to church and is declaring that something will happen in Ghana. What will happen? If you like, call the people's name. Call the color of their singlet. It doesn't mean anything. Even the spirit of divination can review pictures. What will show that you have authority is when you speak, spirits obey. If spirits obey when you speak, then we can know where your allegiance is. Because it said in 2 Corinthians 10, from verse 3 to 5, it said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It said, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold. It says, casting down imagination. And every high standing thing that opposes itself above the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity all things to the obedience of Christ. It says, when your obedience is complete, then you can avenge other disobedience. If you go anywhere and they tell you righteousness is only a nature, know that there's compromise there. Because righteousness is not only a nature. I'm talking because I'm a man. A baboon can't talk. So when a man is living in immorality and claims it doesn't matter, that his nature is the nature of a man, something is wrong. If it's a nature, it must manifest in your character. Because character proceeds from nature. How come you claim you have the nature of God and you are not living like God? And you say it's okay. You are a sick Christian. Something is wrong. And so because righteousness was prosecuted on the cross, and the cross insists that the love of Christ should constrain us, we can't live for ourselves. There's no such thing as coming to cry, Lord, I'm sorry, I, I, I was overtaken. You are a babe. Wake up. That thing you are crying to God for every day, there are people who have the same temptation, but they stood their ground. May God not let you go to heaven with such people. Because when you come and say it was not easy, they will show you people who lived in your generation and were able to live, about, live above it. They will become the reason why you will be judged. Did you not read? He said the whole world was judged because of Noah's perfection. When everybody says it's not easy, it's not easy. I'm in the police. They say we must take bribe. There's somebody else in the police that never took bribe. That one person will become your judgment. You say every politician must, must cut corner, must compromise. There's one politician who didn't compromise. That one politician will become your judgment. That's how God functions. We must live right because we are righteous. The second thing about righteousness is that righteousness is the nature of God that makes God right all the time. And so because of that, righteousness is a force. Righteousness is a power. Because the reason God is right 
accurate and distinguished in glory is because anything God says becomes. I told you yesterday, if God tells you you are tall, even if you were short, you become tall. So the reason God is accurate is because there is an investment in power in the utterance of God that anything God says becomes. And so when God made us righteous, he didn't just bring us to a place of right standing with him. He credited power into our life. That's why he said, they that are righteous, they will reign in life. Because now there is a power on their lives. When somebody is demonized and you come to the person and say you are free, because you say you are free, the demon knows that he can't be there. If somebody is sick and you come to the person, you know, if, you, if you notice, everything we say is in past tense. When we come to the sick, we don't say you will be healed. No, we say you are healed. Because everything we say, there's an authority that makes it happen. That authority came from righteousness because we can't be wrong. What we say is what is. And so if somebody is dying, you come, you say, live and don't die. And somewhere, somehow, the power for life will enter that person. The reason that is so is because God has made you righteous. And so any believer who knows that he has the nature of God and the righteousness of God must become audacious in exercising the authority of God because righteousness comes with authority. You see why the preacher is casting out devils, he's not afraid. It's not necessarily because of what he did. It's actually because of who he is. That the realm where he functions now, there is authority over demons. And so when I come to a demon possessed and I say out in the name of Jesus, if the person like, if you roll on the floor, I'm not moved. I've given a command. The demon must obey because I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I can look at somebody and say, be healed. And the person start becoming more sick. I will not be perturbed. The moment I said be healed, life will be mobilized into that person because I'm the righteousness of God. The reason we rule and reign is because we are righteous. And so the power to reign is a gift. That's who a Christian is. Your king in life. He said where the word of the king is, there's power. He said who can say unto him, what doest thou? The righteousness you have is not your own. It's God's own. And so it's also God's authority you work with. If your righteousness was your own, you would have been functioning with your own authority. But we don't use our own authority. We use the authority of God because he gave it to us. He credited it to us. And that's why you function in the name of Jesus. And so when you come, it's like having the key to the door. It doesn't matter if it's a matter. It doesn't matter if it's a wood. The key opens the door. And so when you show up with God's authority, it has already been written in the spirit that every knee bows to that authority. Every tongue confesses the lordship of that authority. And so when you are coming, your problem now is not theological debate. The demon can come from the air. It can come from the water. It can come from the land. When you show up, you say, in the name of Jesus, come out. The demons know. They know. Demons are sufficiently educated to understand that no authority can challenge Jesus. Because when Jesus came to settle the matter of righteousness, he didn't do it on earth. He went to hell. He went to the stronghold of the devil. Because if he did it on earth, the devil can ask for a rematch and say, we fought where you were strong. He went to Hades. The Bible said he descended into hell. And while he was there, he said, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a public show of them, triumphing over them by the cross. It was a public show. Angels know, demons know that they have been defeated. It's only men that don't know. But the moment a man understands that he's righteous, he knows that righteousness is power. He knows that righteousness is authority. It's not theological doctrine. You can explain it and call it a doctrine, but it's a power. It's beyond a doctrine. Every man who is righteous and knows he's righteous is a creature of authority. Because what gives you authority in the kingdom is your right standing. And it's the nature that you have. The nature you have defines your class. And your right standing defines your moral competence to exercise authority. Both of them are included in righteousness. We are in the God class. And when we speak, we speak from the God class. But the reason we are in the God class is because we are righteous. This is why pains hear you. This is why growth hear you. This is why demons hear you. Every creature in the universe hears you. And 
man, they obey you. You don't have to be an apostle to exercise authority. You have to be righteous. If you are righteous, you become a creature of authority because you now operate in the God class. When Christians are afraid, they are not rightly taught. When Christians are demonized, they are not rightly taught. When Christians are oppressed, they are not rightly taught. Demons should fear you. How bold can a dog be and he goes to a lion's den to torment the lion? Have you seen a dog that is that bold? Unless that lion is dead. And even if that lion is dead, the dog will be careful. That's how we operate. Because we are righteous, we are in the God class, we are seated with God in his throne. Far above principalities and powers. So authority now is not a privilege. You know, many people exercise authority and they say, thank you, Lord, for the privilege. It's not a privilege. Authority is a right. He said, as many as believed him, to them he gave the right. It's a right. It's a legal force. Just the same way the policeman who is stopping the tanker on the road is not doing it by privilege. He's doing it by right. No matter how crazy the tank driver is, when the guy is wearing that uniform, which is right standing, and he stretches his hand, the guy will stop. It's not about the size of the tank. The demon can be as tall as this building. It can be as short as a monkey. His shape doesn't matter. You come with righteousness. And when you speak, they cannot but obey. Who is ready to exercise authority tonight? Yeah. Ah, ah, ah. Ah, ah, ah. Next time, hear this. Next time when you are going out of your house, you know the job where you work. There are many people there who want you dead. When you dress up and you stand in front of the mirror, tell yourself, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, no weapon fashioned against me shall prosper. Hey, they can gang up against me. They can be a hundred. It doesn't matter. When I move, heaven moves with me. When I move, angels move with me. I come with an entourage from another government. When I started preaching, they told me there are some territories that are hard ground. They say, if you come there, you will meet demons. You will meet this. I now ask myself, if I have to deal with hard grounds, how do I preach? I leave Ghana. I go to Manchester. I return to Nigeria. I go to Zambia. I come to Ghana. I'm in Cape Coast. I'm in Accra. If I have to go and check the territory and address the territory, where will I have time to preach the message? And God told me, my authority is universal. You are coming from heaven. And so anywhere, anywhere is under that authority. And he said, my spirit is a king spirit. Any spirit, anywhere is under his dominion. All you need to do, come in the name of the Lord. For the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run it there. If you are not righteous, you can't enter there. But if you are righteous, you run it there and you are saved. The righteous will come in the name of the Lord. That's how we walk. Praise God. I don't have time. I want to address some issues now. Quickly, I'm not feeling any anointing. Let me leave that disclaimer. I'm not feeling anything. I'm not sensing the Holy Ghost. I want to talk based on this truth because it's not a lecture. It's a reality. If you have an issue, maybe in your organ, your chest or somewhere, or you have a pain of some sort, or you have an ear condition or an eye condition, you can't see where, you have pains in your ear, you can't hear, or your bone, there's a joint condition. Just put your hands there now. What did I say righteousness is? It's the nature of God that makes him always right. So right that whatever he says becomes, even if it were not so, right? All I want you to do is just relax. Don't try to do anything. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. I wish I had time. Somebody else would have done this. So that you don't say he's an apostle. I take authority over every bone condition. 
over every joint condition, over every form of pain. In the name of Jesus, I curse you. I command the pains be gone. I command the pains be gone. I command the pains be gone. In the name of Jesus, you are healed. Ear begin to hear perfectly. Eyes begin to see perfectly. Every growth in the body, you are banished right now. Be gone from their bodies. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. If there be any growth in your body, any irregular growth that is not of God, that is in your body now, I command that growth to dematerialize. You have a chest condition, your heart is palpitating, I command the heart to become stable now. You have a gastric condition. There's a gastric condition, your stomach, it looks like you eat, you want to vomit it. And there's so much heat and very high level on, on, on rest because of a gastric gland issue. I speak to your, your body, every fluid in your body right now, be restored to normal in the name of Jesus. I speak perfection. I speak wholeness. I speak perfection. I speak wholeness. I command every form of paralysis in the name of Jesus be gone from their bodies. Right now, receive perfect well-being. Receive perfect well-being. Receive wholeness in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Now, check your bodies and attempt to do what you couldn't do before. Attempt to do what you couldn't do before. Attempt to roll this brother out for me again. Attempt to do what you couldn't do before. Just push it. Push the wheel. Push it to come. Ah, hey, ah, hey. Ah, hey. Jesus, you are cursed. I command every dead cell, receive life. Receive life. Receive life. In the name of Jesus.
five months. Yeah. How did it start? I was driving. You were driving? Yeah. And suddenly this part of you just died. Have you been able to walk on your own? Have you been able to walk on your own before? You've not been able to walk on your own like this before? For five months? Yesterday was... Uh, First time you stood up. So you've not been able to walk like this? The Lord is perfecting this healing. You will exercise yourself every day. And it will grow from glory to glory. You can't be paralyzed. I caused this affliction to its root. For five months, he's not been able to stand. For five months, paralyzed. I ministered to him yesterday. He stood up for the first time. Go and exercise and keep building. As you walk, you become better. Those of you who let him keep walking, keep exercising it. Keep exercising it. That demon leaves, life returns to the body. Not been able to stand for five months. Check your bodies, check your bodies, check your bodies. You have noticed a change. Can I see your hand? You have noticed a change in the name of Jesus. We are out of time, we are out of time. If you have noticed a change, can I see your hand? Quickly, just your hand. I'm seeing a hand at the back there. Check your body. You've also noticed a change. Wave your hand. Wave your hand. I want to see it clearly. You've noticed a change. Praise God. Okay, two, three of you come quickly. Let me see what, hear what has happened. My goal tonight is to make you know that this is our life. When things are going wrong, speak to those things. They hear you. Touch those things. They will respond. In the name of Jesus. What was the challenge? Give him the microphone quick. You had a challenge with your ear. Put, let, let's hear you. Put the mic. I was having a problem with my ear, this side of my ear. And I was finding difficult to do it like this for almost two weeks now. You had a challenge with your ear. Yeah, what was the challenge? I find it difficult to hear. Like, you couldn't hear with your left ear. Yeah, for like at, two weeks now. And at the same time, you couldn't bend yeah, your hand. Yeah. What happened now? Can clearly, you like, can hear clearly. What happened to you? I had, I come, come. You couldn't breathe yes, well. Yes. Now I went to the hospital. They say it's awesome. You went to the hospital. They said it's awesome. No. Can you breathe well now? Yes. Wow. Give the Lord a big hand. This is Overcomers Conference. What you've received, take it out and dominate your world. Some of you need to begin to speak to your businesses. If you don't talk to that business, it will fail. Thank God for the business strategies you have learned and you are applying, which is good. But support that business with life. Talk to it. As you talk to that business, you will see the business begins to improve. Some of you need to talk to your family. Speak over your families. Otherwise, the devil will wreck it. When you talk, you are enforcing righteousness. There is righteousness in your spirit. You communicate it through words. And as you make those declarations, you see things begin to open. Some of you need to speak over the ministry. The individual ministry and the corporate ministry. God has put a song in your spirit to bless the nations. God has put a word in your spirit to bless the nation. If you don't decree, that ministry will go nowhere. We change things by talking because that's the way you put righteousness to work. When you speak, things conform. I decree over you. As you step out of this conference, you become a wonder to your generation. Everything you touch from this day going forward, it will prosper because of the life in you. You become an answer to your generation. You become an answer to the cry of your family. You become an answer to the cry of your nation. 
with the consciousness of righteousness as you step out of this place begin to reign and rule in life thank you father you will not be the same again the glory of God in your life has increased and so go into the world and shine go into the world and shine go into the world and shine all the battles you were fighting as you return you will discover the demons are gone the oppositions will bow as you return the mountains you contended with as you go back they will disappear in the name of Jesus I prophesy let new doors open to you step into a new grace step into a new authority go back and reign go back and overcome go back and rule in the name of Jesus Christ lift your hands toward heaven and honor the Lord thank him for what you have received thank him for what you have received upon the throne if you were blessed by this message you just listened to and you wish to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior kindly repeat the prayer after me dear Heavenly Father I believe in your son Jesus Christ and that he died for my sins and was raised from the dead for my justification I therefore confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life I receive eternal life into my spirit I am born again thank you father in Jesus name Amen. If you just said this prayers, please send us an email at info at encounterjesusministry.org or info.ejmi.ng at gmail.com. You can also visit our website at www.encounterjesusministry.org.